What's up, everyone? Welcome to Bill Brons and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Bron Bafflestone. So today we're having another tactical analysis of my Molbron Dowlock Stone build, this time for level 11, which I have recently achieved. And I'm very excited. This is a big power bump for me. And I've played one session so far as a gold, uh, or as a level 11 character, and it was pretty sweet. <laughs> and my new ads were very critical. So, as usual, I'm going to talk us through my character sheet and discuss some of the changes that I've made, why I've made them, some of the tactics that I've been using, and have, you know, whether they've worked and whether they haven't worked, and all of that fun stuff. So, without further ado, here we go. Have to refer to my notes here. So, I am currently a level 11 Dowlock. I have 91 hit points, and I have Armor of Agathis now, which I'll talk about more in a bit, which gives me 25 temporary hit points. So pretty beefy. Um, and I found that that's very important because I have been attracting a lot of attention from enemies, and despite my attempts to be an ultimate defense caster, I can't always keep them off of me. So having a lot of hit points really helps, especially if you have a battle in which you get knocked down to one hit point, which is what happened last time, even through my armor of Agathis. So I was very happy to have uh, all of these hit points. Uh, and in fact, I plan on leaning into this, and at next level, I plan on adding Resilient Khan, and that's going to uh, bump my constitution up to 18, because I'm going to switch my feats around a little bit and... Um, uh, make sure I get a plus one con with my plus one charisma, uh, train, retrain a half feet. Um, and uh, yeah, that's going to play into the whole tough rock man motif that I'm going for here. Just having a big stack of hit points is the least cheesy ultimate defense out there. And I've just been finding a lot of resistance to some of my non AC slash hit points means of defending myself. Uh, flying for, at extreme range, using stone shape, using wall of stone. Sometimes the DM is just really set on making them not work, and ultimately having a lot of hit points is um, is just safer. It's a safer decision, and so I'm, I'm still going to be ultimate defense casting, but I'm also going to be buffing my toughness. AC is still 14. Not much I can do about that. Very hard to get uh, armor bumps in terms of uh, magic items on the Forge Concordance. And my playstyle, it's not usually a big deal. I don't get hit that often, and when they do, or when I do get hit, I've got a big stack of hit points to help me survive through it. My initiative is plus two, no changes there, that's still bad. But I am about to acquire a Sentinel Shield, and so that will give me at least advantage on my initiative rolls. Uh, and I added Lucky as a feat, which I'll talk about in a minute, but I'm not going to hesitate to use a Lucky point on rerolling my initiative if it's bad. Winning initiative is very important, and I know that I did a tongue-in-cheek short saying don't win initiative, but way too many people took me seriously <laughs> on that. Uh, for the record, folks, winning initiative is very, very important. In terms of action economy, it's critical. It gets you uh, basically plus one in terms of actions relative to your enemies if you can go first. And that's huge. If we're talking a four round battle, that's uh, having an additional action is a 25% bump, right? If it's five rounds, having an additional action is a 20% bump. Uh, 16.7 if it's six rounds. Uh, the point being, that's a huge bump in terms of action economy, and winning action economy is how you are an efficient player. And let's not forget, efficiency is the fourth of the seven tactical aspects of combat. Harkening back to my very first original seven part series on how I approached this game, you know, that started this channel. So, uh, yeah, check it out if you haven't seen that series. I think it's. Uh, going to be very helpful for the vast majority of players. Alrighty. So my saves are not that amazing still, no change to them, except I did add Lucky. Uh, again, I'll talk about that in a minute when I get to feats. 
My attack bonus and save DC are still plus 9 and 17. So not amazing, but decent. I definitely don't need a great save DC because I almost never cast any save spells. And while I would love to hit more, um, you know, the investments that I would have to make to get my attack bonus bumped uh, aren't worth it relative to the other things that I can gain from it. And plus nine is fine. I've been, you know, hitting often enough. Then I have three Eldritch Blasts. Man, that is a good feeling as a warlock to get to level 11 and get three beams on the old Eldritch Blast. And uh, yeah, not much more to say than that, right? It is super awesome to be able to get that extra damage, especially since my beams are buffed up by my invocations. We'll talk about invocations in a minute, but first, feats. So I have retrained out of Metamagic Adept, which I had been using for Subtle Spell and Extended Spell, and I have gone to Lucky. And I'm feeling pretty good about these changes. Now, uh, Metamagic Adept did do a lot of good work for me because when I was 10th and uh, 10th level and below, I only had two Warlock slots, and as a summoner, the ability to extend a summon out to two hours duration and then take a short rest to get the slot back was very helpful for me because I was able to leverage that pretty frequently, and that allowed me to go into battles with both a summon active and two slots. So it did a lot of good work for me. But now that I am 11th level, I have three slots and my Mystic Arcanum. And so with that many slots, I feel comfortable enough to drop Extend Spell and, uh, and just go with the slots that I have. And I will miss Subtle, but honestly, I literally have never used it. It was just something that helped me sleep better at night as a Silver Bullet versus Counter Spells. That way I could get my ultimate defenses off subtly without being counterspelled, but I did add counterspell to my list as well. So with the additional slots and having counterspell myself so that I can counterspell a counterspell if someone tries to counterspell my ultimate defense, I feel comfortable dropping it. And I feel great adding Lucky because I have seen a couple of my colleagues use Lucky to great effect. Not too many sessions go by where I wish I didn't have Lucky. And so adding it feels really good. Not only can I get off criticals, which helps my durability and especially helps versus those types of creatures that have amazing criticals, for example, Vorpal Decapitation, that's always a nice thing to get off of with a lucky point, and it will bolster my saves. As I said, I wasn't too happy with the quality of my saves, even though I don't really have too many holes, I don't have amazing saves either. and so. Adding Lucky to get me a reroll on my saves when I fail them, that is really sweet. And I will have the ability to create super advantage if I need to land a critical uh, attack roll. I can just close my eyes, roll at disadvantage, but because of the mechanics of Lucky, I can then add that and choose my pick of the three dice. And this is not an exploit, I should mention. I did a video on this, and it's literally the rules as intended. Jeremy Crawford has said, yeah, that's exactly how we want that to work. We look at it as fortune smiling on the uh, unlucky, when you're lucky. So I think that's great for that. And if I have to counterspell something and it's sixth or higher level, being able to reroll that check can be critical. So very, very happy to add lucky here. and. I still have Skill Expert Intimidation, but I do plan on dropping that soon. I'm keeping it for now, but the reason that I had it was to help me with the Infernal Calling interaction with Cloak of Flies, but I have dropped that. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but for the moment I'm keeping Skill Expert Intimidation, but at next level I plan to change it to Charisma plus one and Constitution plus one, and then with my new feat add Resilient Con and that's going to get my constitution up to 18. That will bump my hit points, that will bump my um, concentration saves, it'll bump all my other constitution saves and play into my durable rock man thing. So uh, that's the plan, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet because plus one con isn't going to help me right now, and I do intimidate things sometimes, 
And so I may as well keep that bonus until the time comes and I make 12th level. Now let's look at my abilities, specifically my invocations. So I currently am rolling with Agonizing Blast, Repelling Blast, Eldritch Spear, Eldritch Mind, and Devil Sight. And so since my last tactical analysis, in which I picked up Minions of Chaos, I have dropped that because while I did appreciate the power of having an elemental, it was sometimes difficult to roll it out at the right moment because of the fact that you lose concentration and it becomes hostile to you. And that's something that's very problematic. And so uh, it takes some careful gameplay to avoid. And I was just feeling the investment was too high. I wanted to use that invocation for something else. And I felt like the summons that I could roll out without minions of chaos were fine. They aren't as good as an elemental in all cases, and I've definitely gotten some good work out of those elementals in the adventures I've played with it, but I did decide to drop Minions of Chaos, and I did decide to drop Lava Cloak, because I was only using Lava Cloak for two reasons. One, for role-playing, to get myself my really cool obsidian armored up look, and two, to take advantage of the Infernal Calling interaction. And I did go with Infernal Calling for 10th level, and I ultimately decided to drop it because I was running into too many role-playing issues. My colleagues were just really sketchy about me summoning devils and binding them to my will, and they would ask me not to cast it, and they would cause you know, drama if I cast it without their consent, and uh, plus I would have to talk to the DM a lot to you know, explain how I was going to make it work and whether it would work and all of that. And so even though all of the rolls were stacked in my favor and I basically never failed a roll and I could use it reliably, just from a metagaming perspective, it was a hassle. And I finally decided, you know what, I think I'd just rather roll with my Tasha summons and such and not deal with this stuff on a regular basis. That also allowed me to free up an invocation. I was able to drop my Lava Cloak and uh, I'm going to be able to get the same benefit for role playing by, uh, you know, reskinning Armor of Agathis to give me that look that I want. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's why I'm with uh, these five invocations at the moment. And I just added Repelling Blast uh, with the, my bump to 11th level because with three beams, man, having Repelling Blast is very cool. It's something that I can use to control the battlefield, especially in those cases where an ally is restrained. Man, I'm starting to see this a lot where there's just badass creatures that have the ability to hit you and restrain you and maybe on top of that do bad things to a restrained creature and being able to smack it with a repelling blast and free my colleague from that restrainment or grapple is really valuable and just being able to move people around is so good being able to push people into ally aoe being able to push creatures off of boats for example uh, that played a pretty big part in my last adventure, which was a sea adventure on a boat, and knocking them off the side of the boat was really awesome. In fact, there was another warlock that also had repelling, and so uh, the battles went pretty well for us because of that, right? But just, you know, being able to pe push people off of cliffs and into difficult terrain and into lava and, you know, all of that stuff is really good, especially when you have three beams. So very happy to add repelling. And I added Devil Sight, finally. I didn't have it at the time of my last review at level 9, and I feel really good on having it, <laughs> I have to say. I had been using my familiar and seeing through his senses to get his Dark Vision and Devil Sight when I was not in combat, and then I've been relying on my Lava Stone of Continual Flame that my familiar would light up in combat, and then I would be able to you know, see the battlefield and you know, not have to worry about having dark vision or devil sight. But it really was debilitating uh, in, in a lot of cases. Like my familiar would die and then I'm trying to wander around in a dungeon with no dark vision whatsoever. That was a pain in my butt many times. Um, and then sometimes, you know, creatures are outside of the very small, uh, you know, lighted area of a continual flame item and I couldn't see them, and it was just annoying. And finally, I just bit the bullet and I added Devil Sight. And I feel really good about it. It really comes into play quite a bit, 
especially since as an Earth Genasi, I don't have dark vision. Now, I am very excited for the changes in Monsters of the Multiverse, where the Earth Genasi gets dark vision now, and that will be amazing. But those changes haven't come through on the Forge Concordance. Uh, when they do, maybe I will drop Double Sight again and pick up a different invocation. But for the moment, I feel really good having it. Uh, then Eldritch Spear, of course, is awesome. Having that 300-foot range really matters. Um, it, it's a big difference from 120 feet, especially if you play the keep away type of strategy that I do. Sometimes I am at extreme range and I don't really want to get closer and not having to worry about being out of range with my Eldritch Blast is very helpful. And of course Eldritch Mind is amazing to help me on the concentration saves, especially at next level when I'll be at plus eight on my concentration save. And uh, yeah, of course Agonizing Blast is a no-brainer. Um, I still have Sanctuary Vessel. That is pretty awesome. Now, it's not as great an ultimate defense as I kind of had envisioned. I've never used it to pull enemies, or sorry, pull allies out of danger and into my ring, but it is very helpful for that 10 minute short rest where you're not asleep. That allows me to short rest trick a one hour summon, a one hour cast like Armor of Agathis, and get those slots back while still having the effects of those spells. So that's been very helpful, and it's also been very helpful for role-playing, for traveling, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And it still has some conceivably positive uses in terms of subterfuge. Um, you know, sneaking a party into an encounter through the ring while the uh, you know, enemy or the people that we're engaging with are just faced with one of the party members or even a summon or a familiar. Uh, and then the rest of us are, you know, in tow, but unknowingly so, and can possibly get surprised, uh, or can possibly circumvent certain obstacles, right? Like everyone goes into the ring, and then my familiar flies us up the mountain instead of having to take a long time and risk treacherous dexterity saves and constitution saves and stuff. Uh, so very happy to have Sanctuary Vessel. It's a really, really powerful ability. Uh, in a West March, you really can't necessarily, well, you, not you can't, but it's not necessarily the easiest to use it in its full capacity, but man, at a table, it's super good. And even in a West March server setting, it's still really good. I have Elemental Gift, of course, that's always doing some work. Bludgeoning Resistance is amazing. Fly with Hover is always amazing. And my Mystic Arcanum. I have added that, and I'll talk about that more when I get to my spells. And yeah, three slots, baby. Warlock 11 gets three slots. That feels so good. That just gives me so much more versatility. I don't have to play around with rest tricking uh, extended summons. I have the luxury of throwing down an armor of Agathis and still being able to do stuff. It's uh, really nice. Uh, in addition, having that Mystic Arcanum is an additional slot, and so that helps. My slot resource management is much easier now at 11th level. Then a quick look at my DPR output. It's uh, still really strong about 145% of the Elite DPR baseline, even though the Elite DPR baseline did get a bump at this level. It, you, uh, at 10th level it was 25.5, at this level it's 34, because the baseline is based on uh, a fighter with crossbow expert and sharpshooter and dex 20, and at level 11 that character gets extra attack times 3. So pretty big bump, and this uh, build still keeps up. You know, I'm at about 50 points of uh, DPR output, combined through my personal agonizing spears, my imp with his tentacle rod, which I'll talk about a bit, and with my summon shadow spawn, which is the one that does the most damage. So yeah, for a damage platform, I'm still performing very well, and that's not even counting the fact that my blast can be repelling. So damage and control as a regular thing from a cantrip. Gotta love it. All right, next, looking at my spell selection. So my concentration options, I have Banishment, Summon Shadow Spawn, Summon Aberration, Summon Greater Demon, Wall of Stone, and Conjure Fae. Conjure Fae is my Mystic Arcanum. I agonized over this. I will probably do a video specifically going over the options for 6th level Mystic Arcanum because, man, Summon Fiend is really good. Mass Suggestion is really good. Tasha's Otherworldly Guys 
is really good. The uh, investitures can be interesting. Uh, you know, an investor of stone has good role playing synergy with my build here. Uh, there are a lot of really good options. I finally decided on Conjure Fey because of the Dusk Hag. There are like three viable summons that you can get out of the uh, Conjure Fey. You know, I'll probably use the Yeth Hound quite a bit. Maybe the Anis Hag in special occasions. But as my go-to, the Dusk Hag is pretty awesome. I mean, I put its stats on the screen. 17 AC, 82 hit points. It's very durable. It's got some nice immunities against, you know, uh, blinded and charmed and frightened. It's got good skills. Deception is very good, especially since it can cast Disguise self at will. And uh, insight and perception are always really good. Uh, but uh, the main reason that I'm getting it is because of its amazing spell selection. So first of all, having scrying and legend lore available is fantastic. Now maybe not necessarily in a West March, but there are definitely times even within this West March setting where having either of those would be very useful. And so to be able to get that in a summon that does a lot of other stuff, it's really nice. Uh, kind of a side benefit, but one that I am not overlooking by any means. Then it can cast Detect Magic at will, which is pretty nice when you're out and about, uh, you know, you're going to precast this thing because it's a one minute summon. And so while you're walking around, it can be concentrating on Detect Magic and noticing any magic stuff. So that's really nice. Then in combat, it can cast Hypnotic Pattern three times a day. That's really good. Control out of a summon without me having to concentrate on it. I'll take that. Now, the DC is 15, so that's not amazing, but that's still going to stick against a lot of creatures. And when you you can have your Dusk Hag do it three times a day, it can just spam it, because you're only expecting it to last one battle. So that's really nice. Being able to drop Sleep as a finisher with a 9d8 cast, that's also really nice. That's about 40 hit points that, as soon as you see something get bloodied, you can just drop them instantly with no save through a, a sleep. That's fantastic. And even when it's not casting spells for me, it is a pretty decent combatant with that nightmare touch. You know, it doesn't do quite as much damage as a Tasha's summon or summon greater demon, but it's not bad. So I really like having the Dusk Hag available through Conjure Fey. <coughs> Pardon? Now the problem with Conjure Fey is that like Conjure Elemental, it becomes hostile to you automatically when you lose concentration. And so right now my concentration isn't amazing. Even with Eldritch Mind, when I only have a plus three, I have about a 9% chance of failing and that's too high. I don't feel comfortable rolling out Conjure Fey unless it's under very careful conditions. But at next level, I'm going to be adding Resilient Con. So my um, concentration save is going to be plus eight at advantage, um, and at level 13 it'll be plus 9 at advantage, and that's safe enough for me to roll out Conjure Fey. I'll automatically pass a regular concentration check, I'll have a very good chance of passing most concentration checks that exceed normal, and it just makes me feel comfortable enough to add Conjure Fey as my Mystic Arcanum. I also have Banishment, and I'm considering dropping it, I never use it. I thought because I could upcast it onto two creatures I might use it some, but I still never do because I always have summons out there anyway, and then I just don't have the slots to cast it. I do like it because it's a silver bullet against being plane shifted. I could always uh, get back to the prime material plane if I banish myself, if I get plane shifted, and that's a cool silver bullet to have. And I have to admit it's something of a money maker for me in the Forge Concordance because sometimes people need a banishment cast on their sword or whatever, and I charge for that, and people have hit me up for that, and I make money for it. But I do probably plan on dropping it eventually at some point. Then Summon Shadow Spawn and Summon Aberration are my go-to Tasha summons. I like the Shadow Spawn a lot because it has the most hit points, 65. It does the most damage with a base D12. That damage is cold, so it's a good one to throw out once my initial summon has been um, killed, uh, as it does really good damage even without an Insignia of Claws, uh, I can place it properly 
when I'm summoning it, summoning it so I can leverage better its rather large uh, despairing scream ability, which has a 30 foot radius, and that makes it a little clunky to deploy without friendly fire sometimes. Especially when you're starting with a summon on the field and you're not summoning it uh, and placing it as you want. And I really love Summon Aberration. The Beholderkin is a go-to for me when I need that fly speed plus ranged attack as a damage platform. And I really like the slotty version as a melee type of summon because it has regeneration. And so it, even if it takes a bunch of damage, it will refresh itself and I can take it into another battle if I'm you know, trying to make that one slot last for multiple battles which I do try to do when the opportunity presents itself. And I have Summon Greater Demon, which is still great as a panic button. I've only really had to cast it in serious battle once, but when I did, it saved the day. And I almost had to cast it again in my last session, which I really can't wait to do a video recap for, but the scenario was that my entire team had gotten banished by the enemy, and it was literally me and like a couple of familiars on the field against like four or five enemies. So I was about to drop a Chasme, but right before my turn came up, one of those familiars was an imp. It managed to land a decent stinger attack on a enemy that had upcast banishment and was banishing two of my colleagues. And so it disrupted its concentration. My allies appeared on the field again and I was like, oh, okay. I don't have to cast a Chasme, <laughs> um, and if I did, it would probably be counterproductive since my colleagues are in the area, so I just went back to my normal strategy. But it's amazing and awesome to have Summon Greater Demon available just as a plan Z, as a final resort that I can use when I really need to go, go Super Saiyan, or Super Saiyan, sorry, I don't watch Dragon Ball, so I'm sure I am pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but if, yeah, if it just happens where I'm the last man standing, or my entire team has gotten banished, or I've been isolated and am away from the team, being able to throw down a Chasme or a Brock is amazeballs, and I love having that capability. And then Wall of Stone. Man, I'm probably going to do a separate video about this. I love Wall of Stone. It is such a powerful spell that when it is deployed correctly, and in the right scenario, and this scenario is very frequent, it will trivialize an encounter. I mean, it literally will. If you can literally wall off your entire party from the enemy, including, but include crenellations, which it literally says in the spell description that you can create, you can unload with your entire party with ranged attacks and spells at enemies that can't do anything to you. And that is an amazing, amazing tactic. The problem is, because of metagaming concerns, I've very rarely been able to roll this out. Because keep in mind that if you are going to do something like that, where you immediately see that the scenario is an automatic win if you just protect your entire party with a wall of stone with crenellations in it, what you're doing is kind of dictating to other players how they have to play their characters, right? You know, maybe that guy wanted to go up and hit them with Great Weapon Master instead of throwing javelins or using an item to cast a spell or something, right? And so it makes it a little uncomfortable to cast in a Westmarch server setting where I'm constantly playing with new players and I and different players and, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers by being that guy who's giving orders and forcing people to play in a certain way. So there's that. Now, of course, you can talk to people and ask them if they're cool with you casting it and ideally you talk about it beforehand and say hey I have this ability to create a wall of stone that will completely win battles for us in a high percentage of cases is that cool with you if I do that and you know if I do are you cool with ranged attacks and stuff like that and the prob the problem with that is that sometimes it's the DM that has a problem with wall of stone because it's all well and good for a player to trivialize an encounter but a lot of DMs don't like that. Uh, a lot of players don't like that because there's this prevailing attitude that, well, the DM gets to have fun too. And if you trivialize their encounter, then it's not fun for them. So you're not really allowed to do that. And I bring it up just because there was one instance, and I don't want to give too many details, where 
I cast Wall of Stone in a way that should have probably delivered an auto win, but the DM was so upset by this that the rest of the encounter went in the most ridiculous, absurd, like that would never happen, are you kidding me? We just did enough damage to break down a Dayern's instant fortress twice over and we still can't get through this makeshift furniture barrier kind of stuff. It was just a very uncomfortable feeling where I felt like I was ruining the game for the DM. The DM was definitely ruining the game for me. Um, you know, it's just it's just weird. So I am keeping Wall of Stone because I love the spell. I love having that capability. Um, and, you know, when you roll it out, in the proper way. It is just an overwhelmingly powerful spell. But I will admit, it's it's one that causes mad metagaming issues, man. I, I was not expecting that. It, it, I think it's a much better option if you're at a regular table where you're playing with friends and everybody knows your shtick and, you know, when you throw out a wall of force, you know, people know what to do. They don't consider it an imposition or uh, imposing on their consent. Uh, and the DM is not going to, you know, have a, a bad reaction to it. But in my Westmark server setting, um, it's been a little dis disappointing, to be frank. Uh, Non-concentration options. I have Minor Illusion. I thought that I would be way too high level to be using Minor Illusion. I still use it all the time. It is a go-to, strongest cantrip in the game, super amazeballs, very happy to have it. Armor of Agathis. Oh man, I'm loving this spell. So I'm casting with the 5th level pass slot, pack slot. I get 25 temporary hit points. That's a lot. I'm currently at 91, so that's a 30% bump uh, to my hit points. Love that. And I love the fact that I do 25 cold damage anytime anyone hits me. Now remember that I have bludgeoning resistance. So against certain creatures, it's literally fun to go up to them and let them wail on me. Because they do bludgeoning damage, they're not hurting me much, and it's going to take them like 4 or 5 hits to chew through those 25 hit points. And on each of those 4 or 5 uh, hits, they're taking 25 cold damage. That's really fun. Like, imagine, um, you know, or even against like a fire elemental or something that has like cold vulnerability. That's uh, pretty sweet. And so I just added that with 11th level. Uh, I think it's a luxury cast, and I didn't think that with two slots it was very viable. But now that I have three slots in a Mystic Arcanum, I am very happy to have Armor of Agathis. Um, it literally saved my butt in my last encounter, where I got knocked down to one hit point, where I started at max. <laughs> so that was really cool, and plus it's playing, um, doing some role-playing heavy lifting for me, because I really enjoy having my evil form. You know, Bill Broad normally is a good-looking guy with a lot of bling, and he's very stylish and well-dressed, but when he gets down to, uh, you know, put, putting his game face on and killing people, I've been using Lava Cloak, or Cloak of Flies, to give me a really cool visual and show off my evil form. And since I dropped Lava Cloak or Cloak of Flies, I can't do that anymore, but now that I have Armor of Agathis, I can get my look. So I appreciate that. Uh, Thunderstep. I am going to be dropping that at next level. I literally never cast it because just Dimension Door is better for me. Uh, you know, I almost always want to get further away than 90 feet, and so I just always opt to cast for Dimension Door. I've I used Thunderstep once, so I'm going to drop it at next level. Uh, yeah, Dimension Door I already talked about. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm casting that all the time. It's awesome. So glad to have it. Um, and Stone Shape. Also a go-to for me. Um, just such a good ultimate defense. It's not concentration, and most DMs have been pretty cool with it. Not all. Some have considered it cheesy and then punished me through uh, gameplay going forward. But most DMs have been cool with it. Um, you know, the good DMs have uh, unrolled interesting tactics against it. Like once I was fighting a canopic golem and I stone shaped, and then he stood on my hatch. <laughs> I was just stuck in there, not able to do anything. Now I could actually I could have dimension doored out, but it was a canopic golem, right? So if you're not familiar with those, they're like literally immune to like spells under seventh level. So there wasn't much I could do to it anyway. So I basically just stayed in there. Um, and uh, was toothless, but uh, you know we won that battle, and you know good on the DM, good on the DM for executing a good tactic against me. You know, next time I'll put an arrow slits. <laughs> uh, I uh, reactions and always on spells. I 
have added Counterspell, finally. Just added it at 11th level. Again, because with only two slots, you just don't have the resources to be Counterspelling stuff. And I was usually too far away. Um, I've added Counterspell just for those constrained environment situations where I've got Spellcasters in my face, and it's very useful. Um, it's still not all that useful for me sometimes because I'm usually pretty far away and I often don't have sight on the battle because I've like, you know, I've dipped behind a door or underneath the hull of the ship or whatever and then, you know, I can't see them so I can't counterspell. But I do feel a lot better having it because, man, there has definitely been times that I have wished that I could cast it. And it's nice to come out of a pack slot since it's always fifth level, right? Then for Blast, I currently am only going with the Cantrips. Eldritch Blast, Magic Stone, Toll the Dead. I do plan on adding Synaptic Static at next level. Um, it's just that I wasn't able to add it this level because I, I could only uh, add one new spell and change out a spell. And uh, I decided to add Armor of Agathis and Counterspell at this level. Um, it was close though. I almost added Synaptic Static instead of Counterspell. So, you know, maybe I made the right decision, maybe I didn't. Actually, now that I think about it, Synaptic Static probably would have been more useful for me. Uh, in the one session that I played as an 11th level character, but whatever. At next level, I will have both. Um, and then for non-combat utility options, I still have Pass Without Trace. I never use it though because it's a concentration spell and I'm typically concentrating on a summon in pre-battle. Um, and Remove Curse. And this is just another silver bullet that I personally feel better having available. Uh, not everyone has it, uh, even healers. And it's also a money maker for me. Again, just like banishment, sometimes people need a, a remove curse cast, um, you know, out of session, and they pay me gold for the privilege. And I still like having it. Finally, my items. So not too much change. Still got a rod of the pack keeper plus one. That is pretty standard for a warlock. Would love to have been able to, um, you know, graduate to a plus two at this point, but I'm pretty poor. And so that just hasn't happened yet. The Tentacle Rod and the Golgari Signet Ring, those are both on my familiar to continue to make him viable at this higher level in Tier 3. And it's still working. Man, my, you know, Imp did some real work in my last session. Tentacle Rod is just a fantastic item. Decent damage, it has that effect. And it's three attacks, so when you're like trying to break a caster's concentration, that's just very, very helpful. And the Golgari Signet. I just added that. I haven't had a chance to use that in combat yet. I think it'll be good. Uh, entangle out of my familiar so the concentration is offloaded sounds pretty decent. It is only save DC 13, however, so I'm not sure how useful it will be. Um, but it will create an area of difficult terrain. Now that I have three repelling blasts, that might be useful sometimes. So we'll see how it goes. I may get rid of it at some point, because I have the Helm of Telepathy as well, which I often like to attune to, but for the moment I have the Golgari Ring. Um, and the Helm of Telepathy I don't currently have attuned, but I do have it available for special occasions, because some missions are mysteries or involve a lot of RP or social situations, and in those cases I can just attune to the Helm of Telepathy, in which case it's a game-breaking item. I have the Smoldering Studded Leather. That's awesome. It not only fits my look and my RP, but it's a magical armor, so I can't get uh, broken by oozes and such. Uh, Cloak of the Manta Ray is a critical add because I'm going for elemental superiority on land, sea, uh, sorry, earth, air, water, and fire. And so having that ability is great. And yeah, I was on a ship at sea adventure last time out. Having Cloak of the Manta Ray was awesome. It's just an awesome thing to have available. It's not attunement, so why not? When you don't need it, you're never going to miss it. When you need it, it's just so, so good. Then I have two Lapis Lazuli spell gems. That's fantastic because with an action, I can resummon my familiar. And since I depend on my familiar so heavily, that is just fantastic. And having two of them means I can do it twice, so even better. Uh, that is the maximum that I can have on the Forge Concordance, only two of a, the, uh, the same item. Otherwise, I would be stacking up as many as I can. But really nice to be able to knock out a familiar without having to go through that 70-minute casting time. Then I have an Insignia of Claws. That still does amazing work for me. I often use the Summon Aberration Slotty, 
and this turns its attacks magical, which is amazing. And plus one to hit, plus one on attacks is always awesome for your summons. And it's a non-attunement item, so great. I got a gem of brightness. That's pretty sweet. I like using that uh, with my familiar and making him, uh, you know, even more flexible and uh, and valuable. I have the ever smoking bottle, which I have never deployed yet because it's problematic. Uh, you know, s sometimes you pop it and then the creatures have you're fighting have blind sight and oh that's not good. But it's still a valuable silver bullet defense against beholders, uh, medusas, uh, bodax. You know, anything with a gaze attack, it's just really nice to be able to blanket the area with a huge, right, huge cloud of smoke. 60 foot radius is massive. Uh, and all of a sudden, one of their main attacks has been shut down. So, love having that available. It was pretty cheap. Uh, the Stone of Level 4 Continual Flame, that's always awesome. I like being able to light up the battlefield, especially when I'm at distance in the dark and then they can't see me. I can see them, so I'm attacking them at advantage. And a Pot of Awakening for Shrubster, my Awakened Shrub. Still have never rolled him out. I have not yet gotten the items that I want to uh, roll him out with, so he just chills uh, at home and, you know, does the dishes. <laughs> so that's it. That's the analysis of my 11th level build, the choices that I've made and why I've made them and how I like to deploy them. And I look forward to doing another one at 13th level when I make it. So let me know what you think in the comments below, and thank you so much for watching. This has been Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill from Babblestone. See you next time.